You're watching Reason and Theology Live, a show dedicated to charitable discussions, debates, interviews, commentary, and analysis. The show concentrates on theological topics, historical matters, and philosophical problems with content ranging from introductory material to in-depth examination. And now, your host, Michael Lofton. Welcome back to Reason and Theology, everyone. Your host, Michael, on a Friday afternoon, we're talking about religious liberty in the post-conciliar era after, after the Second Vatican Council. Is there rupture here? Is there continuity? Has the church changed its teachings on the matter, especially with Dignitatis Humanae, comparing it to Pope Leo the Thirteenth and Gregory the Sixteenth and their teachings, among others? Joining me is Professor Michael Dunningen. Professor, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you so much. I'm fine, and it's great to be with you. Yeah, so I understand you've written a dissertation on this. In fact, I think you've done more uh, work on it in addition to a doctoral dissertation. So it sounds like this is right up your alley. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'll talk about this to people who will listen. So I'm. I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, yeah, I did a. Uh, I did a long MA thesis on the subject, and then. When I worked on my licentiate in canon law, I did a, a shorter, somewhat revised uh, thesis, and uh, then this is the more the magnum opus the, for the doctorate in canon law, uh, really using more international sources and just a much longer, kind of deeper uh, look at the question. So, uh, so yeah, in one way or another. I've been interested in this for over 20 years. So, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm still find it fascinating. Uh, it it can get, uh, some of the authors can get a little bit tedious, but on the mm. whole, I think it's still a fascinating subject, uh, maybe even more so than when I first came across it. Start us out with just the very basics here. What exactly is the discussion revolving religious liberty, and why is it important to us today? Yeah, good, good question. Um, the, really the big question is, does the Vatican II religious liberty document, does it contradict what popes taught in the past? Mm -hmm. And the popes we're talking about especially are the ones uh, that, that, that you've mentioned, the 19th century popes, particularly Gregory XVI, Pius IX, and Leo XIII. There are some other documents that are important, but especially those. And th there are a number of important questions. One is the relationship between church and state. Mm -hmm. One is when can the civil power restrict religion? Those are two key important questions, but really the most important one is what is the status of non-Catholics, especially non-Catholics publicly practicing their religion uh, in, especially in a Catholic environment, especially mm -hmm. if uh, we're, we, we don't have, we don't have as many uh, Catholic, officially Catholic states as there were in the past. Right. There still are some to some, to some degree, sort of more than people think actually. But that, that is kind of the question, even mm -hmm. if these states are disappearing, uh, Still, the question's important because Vatican II recognized a universal right, a natural right, and said in civil society, everyone has a right to religious liberty. The difficulty that that brings up with the popes of the 19th century is that they, uh, they rejected a similar sounding concept. So the, it, it, they didn't really usually call it religious liberty, but it's something very close, often called liberty of li liberty of conscience or mm -hmm. freedom of conscience or freedom of, of cults or worship, or they were often put together, uh, LCC, liberty of conscience and of, and of cults. Uh, so it's just a very slightly different term. And the 19th century popes very much reject that. And the um, uh, what Vatican II does is it uh, it uh, embraces the idea of a right to religious liberty in civil society that's a natural right. So I think our I think the question is so that sounds somewhat alarming I think to a to a, to, to a Catholic to some degree. But I think the question is were they talking about the same thing? 
Were mm -hmm. they, did Vatican II affirm exactly what the 19th century popes rejected? I think that's kind of the key thing. And, and as to why it matters, uh, I think one idea is that uh, really our concept of the church, I think our concept of the, of the church is really, um, really tied in with this. People have been talking about it for such a long time because I think it, uh, I think a lot of, not everyone, but a lot of people really see a difficulty if there is an actual, an actual rupture or contradiction. Some other things that are important is that since Vatican II, the popes, and really I think all the popes, have built their foreign diplomacy. Uh, Holy See has a very great diplomatic uh, heritage. And they've since Vatican II, they've really built it on the religious liberty document. So uh, I think that's, again, that's not necessarily teaching, but it's an important uh, component of the life of the church. And it makes you wonder if there's a real rupture here. Mm -hmm. Have we been building this uh, this component of church life on something that's that's not entirely sound? Um, and I, like I say, finally, I, I think we could you could probably answer between five and ten interesting mm -hmm. answers to your question. Why why is it important? I, I think the, the thing that I, I think is most important is that um, a lot of commentators look at look at uh, this document as a teaching on the church, or I'm sorry, pardon me, a teaching on the state, that this is really talking about the state. And I think that, uh, I think the state is important, but I think it's much more a teaching on the human person. And I think it has extremely interesting things to say about the human person. I actually think it really puts it at the center and to put the understanding of the state at the center, in, in my opinion, is a misreading. The state is important, but what Vatican II in this document says about the state, it really flows from what it first says about the person. You mentioned there that, <clears throat> especially in the post-conciliar era, we've kind of lost a lot of states to the secular realm. A lot of them went from being a Catholic state to uh, being secularized. Do you think that's because of the document on religious liberty itself? But that's an interesting point as well. My, I don't, I, I, I can't say I really know and have mm -hmm. studied that. My, my hunch would be, um, my hunch would be no. Uh, I think that that probably was already um uh was already likely to likely to happen um well, one thing i would say though is something that people expected after this uh document and after vatican ii you know the the church has these treaties uh with different countries and sometimes even with just specific parts of countries called concordats. And mm -hmm. a lot of people thought that, oh boy, this is Vatican II is the end of uh, concordats because it's just, that's such a kind of a, an old school type thing. And now we've got this sort of new teaching. And as you say, uh, less, less officially Catholic states. Um, in fact, though, there, uh, there almost was kind of a revival of concordance after Vatican II. Uh, again, the concordate doesn't have to be with a officially Catholic state. Sometimes there, uh, sometimes the whole point of it is that the state is somewhat hostile to Catholics, and what the Church wants to do is to have a concordate to protect uh, protect the rights of Catholics as much as they can. Or I think in Vatican. In the, after Vatican II, probably would be also concerned with protecting the religious uh, rights of others in addition to Catholics. Um, but so that that was kind of a kind of a surprising thing. And you still do have, you still still do have some countries. Again, not not that many, uh, but you still have uh, um, some countries that, in some way or another are officially Catholic or officially something else too. In Scandinavia, you still have countries that are officially officially Lutheran um, and, and elsewhere elsewhere as well. But uh, uh, yeah, I, I, 
I don't think that it was really the result of this. But if a country, and sometimes you have this question, <clears throat> did Vatican II put an end to sort of official Catholicism or the confessional state? And a lot of people just assert outright that it did. Uh, oh, yes, this is the this is the end of that. It, it, it buried it and buried it uh, deep. And uh, I don't think that's really the case. Uh, really, the document's very modest on that subject, and it says very little. Now, it doesn't reaffirm the confessional state, but it doesn't reject it either. What it, what it really says is that uh, if there's going to be a, a privileging of one religion, whether it's Catholicism or something else, religious liberty has to be provided for everyone. There, there. If there's going to be an official religion, there still has to be religious liberty provided. So I think probably the what the impact that Dignitatis Humanae would have on the Catholic state would be, I, th I believe there still could be a Catholic state, but it might be somewhat, or probably would be somewhat different than um, the Catholic states of the past. And we actually kind of saw this right, right after Vatican II, where, or in fact, maybe even beforehand uh, with the case of Spain. Spain's probably the most, the most famous one where they used to have um, a, a kind of a, a ban on public worship of non-Catholic religions. And in light of the religious liberty document, uh, Spain's, uh, uh, at least at that time, I, I don't know if it's still officially Catholic. I think it is, but but at least after Vatican II, maintain remained officially Catholic. But religious liberty was also incorporated into the uh, I don't know if it's the Constitution or some other some other document. But there, I think you have a window on on what the impact of Dignitatis Humanae would be on a Catholic state. Does that then describe rupture? I mean, because prior to the council, you don't have an allowance for non-Catholics to publicly worship, it would seem. Um, whereas in the post-conciliar era, it seems that that's now permitted. Is there rupture there? Yeah, that's uh, absolutely. Now, the critic critics of um, critics of the document, I think, would point to that and would be quite upset by the the changes in in, in Spain. Um, I don't th personally. I don't think that it's. I don't think that it's a rupture. There isn't. Um, it, it is a development. I think that this is. I think that this. There is something. There is something uh, new about this. Um, but I don't think. Uh, I don't think that there's any teaching that's being reversed. To the extent there's a change, I think the area we're talking about, when we're talking about concordance and uh, really this this whole uh, area of diplomacy and how the church relates to, to, to states. So, uh, there used to be a field uh, called public law of the church. I think it's still kind of I think it still kind of exists in some sense, but you you don't really have people studying it nearly as as much as you used to. Um, to the extent there, there there has been a, a a change or a change of how to um, that sort of sliding scale of what's sort of what's permitted. Um, I think that that is occurring in the area of uh, public law or of or of discipline. But not of not of doctrine. I don't think, and I think I think kind of the sort of the kind of historical question you might get to is in the past where you where you did have something like say Spain or or you know going further back uh, bans on non Catholic worship in a Catholic state. What was the purpose of that? Why was that being be, being banned? And you kind of have two. I think two main alternatives. I think some folks would say, well, it was banned simply because they were non-Catholic, because they were lacking some elements of uh, the truth that the Catholic faith has uh, uh, has in full, and simply because simply because that there there was something lacking, or because the faith differed from Catholicism, that's why they were banned. 
I think the uh, the other alternative answer, though, and I think one that I would lead to pretty decisively is that um, I don't think that was the case, that it was just because it was false. I think when when there was a restriction on non-Catholic worship, I think it was uh, because there was a sense that some danger was was posed. Uh, or some harm, some 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 social harm. If you look at uh, a couple of historical examples, uh, the Donatists, for example, I'm going way back to the mm -hmm. to the, the late uh, uh, antiquity church. Um, you know, really, a, a Donatist. There's really no such thing as a peaceful Donatist. They, uh, the, if if you're a Donatist, you're you're kind of somewhat somewhat violent. I mean, you really didn't see uh, anyone who were anyone who was just a, sort of a theoretical Donatist. Uh, where you had where you had that rise up, you actually had the retaking of churches and violence against the uh, uh, against the church authorities. Uh, as sort of another example in the uh, Middle Ages, um, the, the Cathars or Albigensians, you have kind of the same thing really uh, sort of a damaging social movement. Again, I think we think of them as well. They boy, they had some strange religious ideas, but they also, they also, I mean, they advocated uh, 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 really very much almost an overthrow of society of the most basic uh, sort of social norms. So I think when you, when you had often when you had control or even uh, even the adjudication of heresy. Um, I don't think that every heretic was put on the spot. I don't think the idea was to um, uproot every every heretic. I think, in a way, not, not that not that heresy was was ever a, a good thing, but as Thomas says, the law uh, the law targets problems that pose a real social harm that that really pose a harm to the common good, uh, not so much problems that are only a problem for the someone's individual good. And so uh, kind of in, I guess, response to that, because why did why was there restriction in the first place? I think that it was more because there was the sense, and and it wasn't always just imaginary. There, there really was a sense that this was a threat either to the church itself or to uh, or to uh, Catholics. We had an example of that in the in the U or the early colonial period in the U.S. with Maryland's experiment with toleration, which was very extremely open-minded, but was really, really a failure, uh, be, because the by being by being tolerant and welcoming uh, others, they uh, essentially diluted their own di diluted their own um, uh, majority, and they eventually were persecuted themselves. Uh, so very, very very kind of a dispiriting thing but that's one of i think one of the reasons that took that really took religious liberty so long to arrive sometimes the church even by proponents of the document is criticized for taking so long to get there but there's a french theologian who's done a great deal of work on this document basil valoet and uh he identifies this problem of reciprocity that until we really get to a fairly late period, uh, and he's talking primarily about the mid 20th century, we don't have that assurance that, well, if I extend respect to, to, to your religion, um, am I just making your, your camp stronger and then you're going to topple my camp, uh, or are you actually going to respect my religion? And so once we get to, especially having these international uh, kind of compacts like the UN Declaration on Human Rights and the Ecumenical Council of Churches does one in 1961. Starting then, Valoway says, we have this uh, promise at least, or at least possibility of reciprocity so that you're not going to be kicked in the teeth for showing respect to other people's religions as very much happened in Maryland in the, in the mid 17th century. Well, um, when it comes to this issue of rupture specifically on this topic of um, allowing non-Catholics to publicly worship, it seems, please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like in the preconciliar era, the popes would have seen 
non-Catholics publicly worshiping, um, perhaps in a Catholic country, as an evil to be tolerated. Um, whereas it seems like in the post-conciliar era, at least from the document of uh, Vatican II Dignitatis Humanae, non-Catholic religious public worship is seen as a right, not just an evil to be tolerated. Is there rupture there or is there continuity? That's a that's really a key point. And, and I think exactly the way you the way you frame it is mm. probably the key difficulty that that people have with the document and um uh as you can see just the way you the the way you the way you framed it uh and the idea that as we discussed just the term itself is so similar to the the, the term that the 19th century popes are mm -hmm. using it, it it's it seems at first blush like vatican ii is affirming what mm -hmm. is either the exact same thing or a dead ringer for what the 19th century popes rejected why i think they're the um why i think that's not the case though uh this was one of the most difficult questions to answer at vatican ii and it um was it was one of the i don't know first or second really big questions about in the drafting of of religious and probably the second i would say mm -hmm. and um the question is well what is what is the right the one one problem with recognizing uh when we hear of religious liberty or religious freedom we usually think this is a positive right to worship in any religion i have a positive right so the right is attaching to the content of my religion i have a I have a positive right to worship. And as you say, the popes in the 19th century said, no, there could be toleration of, uh, of other faiths, but not a right because they were, um, for something to be the object of a right, it has to be, it has to be true or it has to, it has to be a truth or a good. So um, the, really one of the breakthroughs at Vatican II is that what it recognizes is not a positive right that attaches to the content of, of every religion, or any religion indiscriminately. What it is is an immunity, and it's a protection of a sphere of activity. So it's not that, um, it's not that you have a right to embrace any religion, but you have a right within reason uh again if you don't disturb the if you don't disturb the uh the peace etc or violate other people's rights you have a right to immunity in your religious decision so that you can't be coerced into one religion or even prevented from exercising your religion even even publicly that's not saying your religion is good the religion mm -hmm. that you're choosing but it's saying that you have a you you have a right to immunity there based on uh now again big big discussion here some people as i said are going to say that's based on an understanding of the state and what the state can do uh i think in the first instance it's really based on an understanding of the human person uh, the person's dignity and several specific components of that dignity but that idea of a of uh, the right as an immunity is a real, a real insight from the council. Uh, we kind of have this with the First Amendment, um, where we, um, you know, you can't. If I, I want to say, you cheated me, uh, you cheated me out of twenty thousand dollars. Just I make this up, and I just say you, you probably there's probably no way you can prevent me from from saying that. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you go to court and say, well, I want to get an injunction because I have a hunch Dunnigan is going to slander me, and so uh, I want an injunction against him. You probably can't can't get that. Um, so, can I say, well, the, this is the court approving what I'm saying and really being on my side? It's not. It's saying I can speak, but it's not approving of what I say. In fact. Day two, after I say this, you can go back into court and hold me accountable for for slandering you. Um, so there's no approval of of what I've said, but there is approve. There is protection of my saying it. Almost always, you uh, maybe a rare exception would be if you're disclosing 
some company's trade secrets or country's national security secrets, then you might actually be prevented from saying what you want to say, but very, very rarely. And and I think uh, the religious liberty, as Vatican II understands it, is is similar. It's um, so as I say, it's not it's not a right that attaches to the content of a of a particular religion. There are kind of a three different, though it's usually spoken of that way, uh, three possible understandings of what a right is. One is called a, a use, I-U-S, uh, right in Latin, habendi, meaning you have a right to have something. It might even be a positive. You have a right to your pension. You have a right to a state pension if you're whatever, a teacher or a soldier or whatever. Um, or a right or a use, uh, uh, um, uh, a use agendi is a right to act. I have a I have right to move about freely within, again, within reason. Uh, can't go into restricted areas, can't just walk onto an army base, but more or less in society, I have a right to move about freely. Uh, but then, and, and most people are going to think of religious liberty as one of those two types of rights, a positive right to have or to more like the second to do something. And uh, a Australian theologian named Brian Harrison uh, has done some really good work on this. And what he says is that, um, uh, and many people, many people have praised him for this insight, is that this is a different type of right. It's what he calls a use exigendi, and that kind of right is a right to require someone else to do something or not to do something, to, to refrain from doing something. And he says, that's what this is. This is a right, not a positive right of, of a person uh, that, it, that calls the content of any belief system good. Not that, not the use habendi, use, uh, use agendi, but only a right to require the person, others in society, not to interfere with my religious action for the most part, without good reason. If there's a good reason, you can interfere with it. If I'm doing something violent, uh, hurting other people, something like that, then then there can be interference. Uh, but um, but he's and he he as I say he calls this third type of right a use exigendi, and that also I think in addition to the idea of the right as an immunity, the right as a use exigendi is another another concept that kind of helps us um, helps us bridge that gap. It's still very difficult, and I think there's still accusations that uh, I think some folks still say, "Boy, that's that's a little too." Uh, that's a little too cute for me, or that's that that's that's sort of going too far. But I think that at the end of the day, at least personally, I believe it does hold up. You know, I think here of young Ratzinger who seemed to take the opinion that, well, yeah, early on in the document of Dignitatis Humanae, it mentions that the traditional teaching of the church has been preserved. But then he says, but the document seems to just go on right after that to completely contradict itself and to you know, introduce rupture. Now, uh, it was, I believe, Bishop DeSmit who did the relatio for the document of Dignitatis Humanae, who he sees, if I recall correctly, continuity, but he can't really explain it. He just kind of says, hey, you know, it's up for the rest of theologians uh, after this to figure it out. Could you maybe comment on that and also correct me if I have any misimpressions there? Um, well, this this theologian, I, I, I you're you're correct that that early on uh the youngish ratzinger did have real doubts that vatican that uh, dignitatis humanae was reconcilable with the tradition he he uh, uh i believe did have that opinion i don't know where it was expressed i don't uh i i don't i haven't heard that challenged but but this brian harrison i mentioned this australian priest um when he was doing his licentiate thesis, he actually wrote to, I don't know if he wrote to Ratzinger or, or wrote to um, his office, but this would have been in the in the 1980s when Ratzinger was at uh, uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And he just simply asked, does, does the card, you know, does the cardinal still hold this position? Mm -hmm. And he got back a you know, polite, but very, very brief answer saying, no, he does not, uh, mm -hmm. does not hold this uh, position any longer. Um, but that, that, uh, 
that passage that you mentioned, what the, what's interesting is it, it says that um, this document affirms traditional Catholic teaching on the duties, the moral duties of individuals and societies towards the true religion. And that's very that's at the very beginning of the document in section one, uh, I think towards the end of section one, but just a couple of paragraphs in. However, that was one of the last things that was actually put into the document. It was uh, put in uh, quite quite late. And uh, there it goes to this it goes to this kind of debate that we mentioned before, what happens with the confessional state? Is, is Vatican II trying to put an end to the, uh, to the confessional state? And uh, this, was, this was, I think, put in to reassure people that uh, not, not necessarily the idea of the confessional state it, itself, because that isn't something that the Pope's have ever demanded that you have, that you put Catholicism in your constitution or anything, but they have said that there is a duty, just as individuals have a duty, there is a social duty to, and uh, sort of a corporate duty to the truth as, as well. And um, so uh, so the, that's really where this section in number one came from. However, there were, a, and I think this is probably why uh, then I think it would probably have been Father Ratzinger had this had this opinion. Um, many, especially the people who had been most in control of the drafting of the document, they hated this last minute insertion. <laughs> people like John Courtney Murray, and uh, if you see some of the uh, scholars from the Bologna School when they write about this, they really hate this, and they say, "Well, these last minute changes." Um, the uh, the Pope put those in or demanded that they be put in to try to win over the opponents of the document, uh, but it didn't work anyway. There still was a fair amount of, of opposition, and it, it really, de from that point of view, again, or from kind of the Murrayite view, sort of derailed the document, that the true document is more the separationist document that separates church and state, that puts an end to the confessional state. Uh, and there definitely were, were people who wanted to do that. Um, I think it's really key to stick to the actual the actual language because you, you get just so many sweeping descriptions of how Dignitatis Humanae put an end to the confessional state or put an end to the so-called age, age of Constantine or it embraced the kind of the Western uh, liberal constitutional order. Uh, I, I think there may be a, a bit of truth to that about uh, 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 at least the warmth of disposition to some elements of what we would call constitutionalism. Uh, but you see in Gaudium et Spes, hey, the church, the church does not have it, any specific economic system, any specific political system. And uh, I think some of the people very invested with Dignitatis Humanae, especially, uh, really especially the Americans and, and to some degree the Italians who were involved with it, really wanted kind of a sort of a Jeffersonian, strictly separationist type of thing. And uh, and even and after the, I don't believe they got that, but after the council, they would, especially Murray would interpret it that way. So uh, there, I think there really have been a lot of open questions. So I think maybe what the, the younger Ratzinger is talking about is maybe at that point, seeing it more like uh, the Bologna school, seeing like this is sort of a Murrayite document, but then at the very end, and in, in uh, I think maybe six weeks or so, maybe less, before the document was going to be voted on, uh, you had some of these uh, some of these uh, changes that the Pope insisted on. Um, but anyway, so I but I, I I think the way to I think the way to read the document is just to stick very close to the text, and it's very frustrating in this area of church and state because it says it says so little you almost have to imagine what a confessional state if it arose or even a uh 
this French theologian I mentioned, Valois, he identifies four types of confessionalism, that there's, sometimes there's an implicit confessionalism, there's a sort of a culturally Catholic or culturally Lutheran state, but there's no sort of affirmation of the truth of the religion. That's one type of confessionalism. But then there's another type of confessionalism that actually does affirm the truth of the religion. And there's something in between that uh, doesn't really affirm the truth of the religion, but affirms maybe the the social importance of the religion to this to to our people in whatever Sweden or whatever state we're talking about. Um, so that's that's kind of another. Uh, I think also a, another bit of a uh, of a tricky of a tricky question, but uh, very symp sympathetic to the young rats here and the difficulty of mm -hmm. interpreting it correctly. But uh, I think kind of the drafting history helps a little bit with that as well. Seems like Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre originally signed off on this document, if I recall correctly. I think I've seen pictures of his signature on the document. But then he goes on to repudiate it and criticize it vehemently. Can you maybe go over uh, what are his criticisms and how would you respond to them? Yeah, I, I, I believe you're. I believe you're correct on on both of those things. Now, at the council, he spoke. Um, he spoke against the document. There, there were. Uh, it was debated twice, and um, I believe in. Well, definitely in 1965, and uh, I, I believe in 64 and 65, both both times in September, and um, he uh, he had a number a number of criticisms. Um, I think one was that he uh, believed that this was, in a sense, kind of incorporating the American system, uh, in, in a sense, this sort of separationist, uh, separationist system. And that actually, that, that actually is something like what John Courtney Murray had hoped to do. He really did see the American system as kind of the modern, kind of the modern version of a natural, a natural law republic in a sense, and really thought that this should be the model uh, for the church. Pro probably the main competing models would have, in a sense, uh, of existing systems would have been the U.S. and and Spain, uh, in a way. Um, and then you had, I don't remember if Lefebvre himself specifically said this, uh, but you had this idea, what about the teachings of the previous popes, especially Leo, especially Leo the Thirteenth, but even, even up to Pius the Twelfth, just the predecessor of the Pope right before right before uh Vatican II, right before uh John the Twenty Third, um that these this especially this teaching on tolerance and uh the Catholic state that you mentioned. Um and I think another point to keep in mind though is these criticisms come up during kind of during the drafting. So uh, some of these things actually were addressed. There was a, uh, as, as you know, most of really all of the Vatican II documents that they had to pass, they had to have two, a two thirds vote, but they all had way, way more than that. And I, I think all but one had a 90% plus and usually much higher than 90% uh affirmative vote and uh but there was a and at the end of the day dignitatis humane uh, didn't have as many negative votes as as were expected it had 70 negative votes it's still that's fairly high i think that was about the the fourth most of any document but there was some real concern that there might be up to 300 negative votes and um Pope Paul VI was very concerned about that. And, but I think he also was, I think he also was, um, uh, saw that in those who objected, there are actually two kinds of objectors, though. There's people like Lefebvre who really didn't want a document on religious liberty. But you also had people who wanted a document, like John Paul II, uh, that Archbishop of Krakow, who wanted a document but they disagreed with, say, some of the things in the Murray type version of the of, of the document. Uh, so they had kind of a, a different view. There is what's sometimes called a French school arose, uh, kind of 
uh, in the mid to the late drafting process and said that the, the, the earlier Murray drafts of the document, Murray wasn't there in the first session. Uh, at the council, there were six drafts of this document, more than any other document, though I believe it's the shortest document. Um, mm. But the middle two were really controlled by Murray, the third and fourth drafts, and they really bear his his stamp. And um, uh, but the latter, the latter two, uh, uh, really don't. They or, or they or they, there still are some some of Murray's positions in there. But this thing of what are we going to found the document on is 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 not. So some of these things are addressed. And kind of the French school, what they wanted was Murray really saw this in political terms. Uh, he really saw this as almost a teaching about the state. And uh, the French school, uh, led by this bishop named Alfred Ansel, said, uh, you know, this should be a more theological document. We should really be talking about uh, what it is about the person that gives him that gives him a right to religious liberty, and 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 really Ansel's main idea, and and uh, John Paul II, then Wojtyla, he shared this idea, and so did this Italian, but a couple of others, an Italian bishop named Colombo, who was very influential. The idea that what's important is that man is a seeker of truth, and and also man's a social being, and so that's why. He, He's also a rational being and a free being, uh, but especially this emphasis on being a seeker of truth and being a social being that he needs liberty to actually to actually uh, come to the truth and should be allowed that liberty. Um, so, th so this is a very important voice and ended up carrying the day as far as what the foundation of the document would be, really carried the day, um, but disappointed the kind of the Murray faction, which up till then had been had been very uh, had been very influential. So um, I, I think that's uh, I think it's important to, in a sense, separate out the objectors. Even yes, you had some people who were opposed to, but even the ones who were opposed to there being any document, they also were influential. But you also had those in a big group, but especially of Eastern European, especially Polish. Um, wanted a document but they wanted it they, they wanted it to be founded in a different way than than kind of uh, uh, Murray's version of, of essentially founding it on the American system. So I have one more question then I want to get to some chat questions. y'all go ahead and put them to at reason and theology there in the chat section. Um, so at the end of the day, why does this matter? What what if somebody were to say, you know what, those preconciliar teachings, let's just assume for the moment that there's rupture and not continuity. Let's just assume that. Um, at the end of the, the day, why does this matter? Because we could just say the preconciliar teachings of these various popes were non-definitive in nature. Therefore, they could be reversed. Vatican II reverses it. And based on the works of, uh, I believe, Dr. Uh, Lawrence King, he wrote a dissertation on non-definitive teachings of the magisterium. He engages this question of religious liberty, and he notes that he takes the position that there's a rupture here. And he says that dignitatis humanae outweighs these non-definitive preconciliar teachings of the Popes, therefore, we're to give religious submission of intellect and will to dignitatis humanae, and we're, we just move on. Why can't we just say it's not a big deal? We just give a sense of intellect and will to dignitatis humanae. Those preconciliar popes are wrong, and we just move on. What's at stake? Good. Um, one thing I would say is, and I think it's entirely legitimate to look at the levels of teaching. I, I think that's why, why do we have them otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do want to know what's what's more authoritative. Um, in my mind, though, I think of that as a last resort in, in a sense. And, and mm -hmm. here's what I mean, um, that uh, I just think it's better to engage the substantive discussion first to, as we said earlier, to, to try to harmonize if we can. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to just look at what's the level of authority, we're probably not talking nearly as much about the substance of what's actually in there. Can the two, uh, can the two bodies of teaching be harmonized? Uh, the second thing is that um, I think when you, this, this isn't kind of an absolute thing, but I'm going to, in my own 
mind, I think of it as a tendency. When we do talk about levels, there can be, I think there's a temptation to sort of assume that there's a rupture. We're mm -hmm. talking about levels, we assume that there's a rupture. You don't have to you don't have to do that, but I think that's I think that's one uh, that can be that can be a danger. Um, the th I would say the third, uh, maybe a, th a third question is um, it goes to some degree back to uh, what we talked about with diplomacy being being uh, built very much on Dignitatis Humanae. It's not just that, but the popes also have reaffirmed this document several times. No, I don't think that changes what the council did. I can't, I don't think the, I don't think the popes can bump up uh, a non-infallible conciliar teaching to an, inf or, or, or a document anyway. They can't bump up the document itself and say, well, we're just going to assume the Dignitatis Humanae, we're going to declare that it was issued infallibly. Um, but we can distinguish between the teaching and the document itself. And I think the popes, we don't just have the document to deal with, but I think the popes have reaffirmed that teaching mm -hmm. uh, several times in these last 50 years. So in this sense of doing the comparison of levels, I think it's perhaps getting more difficult with time as we're getting more affirmations uh, at least of the teaching uh, contained in the in the uh, in the document, and uh, so I, th I think those would be my main mm -hmm. kind of my main concerns. In addition to the ones that we talked about earlier, of just what what is our what is our sense of the church? I actually believe it's a bit hard to see. I think there's a um, I think Vatican II actually makes explicit some of the things that the 19th century popes. Uh, also were concerned about, such as the dignity of the person, really that you, uh, I, I was, I shouldn't say, well, dignity too, but I, I mean more the integrity of the person, that you don't, you don't act like an entirely different person in public than you do in private, that you have real coherence and real, uh, real integrity there. Now, the popes in the 19th century were concerned more with, more with the Catholic faithful, but you see that you do see that because it's not it's not totally obvious, but I think it's really there in the 19th century popes, but I think you see it much more explicitly in Vatican II. So I actually think it's not just that we find a non sort of a bare non-contradiction, wipe our brow and let's be glad that we avoided that problem. But I actually think that the, the teachings really reinforce each other. I actually think the Vatican II proponents should not be at all embarrassed about the 19th century teachings. And I think the 19th century proponents, in a sense, though maybe not that many are, but should almost be grateful for Vatican II, because I think there is a strong current of this, especially this concern for the social life of people that, uh, that really unites the two bodies of teaching. There's a question here from Dr. Richard DeClue. He asks, what does Dr. Dunningen think about Thomas Pink's work arguing that Dignitatis Humanae is in continuity with Leo XIII, though it is debatable whether Leo XIII was in continuity with prior popes? I, I think that um, uh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Uh, Dr. Pink, uh, philosopher at, at King's College, is a... Um, uh, I should say at the outset, I, I I don't agree with his theory, but I just really have to tip my hat to him that he he has uh, oh, about ten years ago, a little more than ten years ago, kind of stoked the fire under this debate about dignitatis humanae, and has just attracted a great deal of uh, interest in his thesis and attention to it, and of interlocutors who he. I think, to his credit, has readily has readily engaged. Um, what I th I actually think, though, um, there's a couple of things about about uh, Dr. Pink's thesis. One is that uh, he, um, especially in his uh, most of his writings on Dignitatis Humanae, I'm not sure about one that he did late last year, but he virtually always describes it as a policy. Just he a kind of a shift in policy uh, from the uh, the old way to sort of the new way that the church, he's saying the state has no coercive authority of its own 
and can only get that authority from the church, or no course of authority in religious matters, rather, but can only get that authority from the church. And what he says is happening at Vatican II is the church is withdrawing that authority as a matter, as the more appropriate thing to do in our time. So I um, I, I disagree with that. I don't see the evidence for it. I, I think it strays too far from, from the text. I just don't see it. And I... Most fundamentally, I just do not think that in the first instance, Dignitatis Humanae is a document about the state. I think in the first instance, it's a document about the human person. Then important consequences flow from that about what the state can and can't do. But I think it's a mistake to, uh, I think it's a mistake to see it as a sort of as a document um, about the about the state. The specific question about Leo the Thirteenth, I certainly believe Leo the Thirteenth is an important uh, important figure. The thing that um, the thing that uh, Dr. Pink has especially uh, zeroed in on is this uh, statement in one of Leo's famous encyclicals, Immortale Dei, uh, talking about the the church being in relation to the soul, whereas the state is in relation to uh, to the body, and so the the, the church, in a sense, can can uh, direct the state. And he see the reason he, I believe, if I understand correctly, that that Pink sees um, Dignitatis Humanae as a teaching about the state is that there's one of the uh, one of the relationes by Bishop De Smet, who we mentioned. Um, contains a statement that's very uh, very amenable to Pink that he uses he uses a great deal. Um, I think that's a difficulty though because that relatio is uh, even though it comes fairly late, it's, uh, it's it isn't on the final document. It's on a it's on the fourth draft and the fourth draft was a very Murrayite draft and that idea of so what Pink is saying is that, what the foundation of the right is, is the distinction between the religious order and the temporal order. Uh, I don't think Pink agrees a great deal with John Courtney Murray, but that actually is very similar to Murray's position, though Murray's is is based, uh, uh, I think, at heart very much, though Murray writes a great deal about Leo the Thirteenth himself, that's very much based on uh, Murray's idea and esteem for the for the American um, the American system so I I don't think that the uh, I don't think that that relatio it's the one from September 1965 on the fourth draft I don't think that that's as important as dr pink does so that's uh that's I guess another another reason where I I disagree though I'm certainly grateful to him for sort of stoking interest in this uh, in this question and for not tiring <laughs> over it. Uh, this is one last question here. Is the Inquisition compatible with religious liberty? <laughs> oh, very, very important, important question. Uh, that's, boy, that would, and that's not unconnected to the question about, about Dr. Pink, I, I, I think, um, because you, the, you get this we have this question, well, uh, where does the right to coerce, if there, if there is right, where, where does this right, where does this right come from? And um, the, uh, I, I think that, um, I think that Dr. Pink leans very heavily to saying that this right, at least in, if it's about religious matters, uh, it, it can only it can only come from the church. Uh, however, there are a lot of other authorities, and I'm thinking of a one actually that Pink relies on uh, a French cardinal named Journet, but also um, also this French theologian I mentioned, uh, Basile Valouet, and a uh, uh, I believe it was a German theologian named Vermeer who wrote a book on tolerance about a hundred years ago. They um, they kind of look at this, they kind of look at the question of the Inquisition, and I think that uh, many of them, I, I don't want to say throw up their hands, but you get to this very difficult question of 
what is what is the reason that they were that the Inquisition was doing what it was doing? I, I assume the question's primarily about the mm -hmm. Spanish Inquisition, the famous one, mm -hmm. uh, and where or more famous one that there certainly were other Inquisitions, and um, the. Uh, uh, I, the the difficulty is we don't really have a record of oh I'm acting for I'm doing this to uh, for civil ends or I'm doing this for religious ends and in in the medieval world we had such a we had such a mixture we had such an I guess an intertwining is uh, is another way that you could that you could put it that it's very difficult to separate out the motives and uh, it seems seems to me that this is uh, at least, at least, uh, to large degree, done for civil, really for, uh, in a sense, for civil motives. I mean, in a sense that this is done again, not because of falsity or anything. Again, these are really people who had converted in the Spanish case had con had converted to Catholicism, and the question is, did they convert sincerely? Uh, I think the fear was. That a might have been mistaken, uh, but uh, the question was: Do they pose a threat to Spanish society or to the government or to other Catholics or something like that? I don't think the I don't think the reason, kind of the reason for that, was to um, was to address just just the falsity of it, or even just to bring back. The person, though it's certainly legitimate to wish to bring back someone who's who's strayed, but I think the when you really Vermeersch talks about this, he says when you actually had sort of campaigns against specific heresies, uh, it was the ones that had a or were believed to have a real social impact. Uh, it wasn't just about falsity, but about either real or threatened uh, social impact and true social harm and uh, ripping a part of the social uh, of the social fabric. Professor, I really want to thank you for coming on and doing this. This has been really, really enlightening. Where can we go to find out more about yourself and your work? Oh, thanks so much. It's been a uh, real pleasure. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, meeting you, at least uh, uh, virtually. I have students who are great fans of yours, so it's just wonderful to uh, uh, to be with you here. It's a real privilege. Uh, folks can uh, write to me at my email, which is mdunnigan at stmeinrad.edu. Saint is written out, not abbreviated. Uh, and um, I've done a number of articles at Catholic World Report, uh, so you can find uh, find a few there, and uh, that probably would would be the would be the best place. Excellent. Uh, and and the, uh, oh, yes. there, uh, there will be a uh, a book based on my dissertation coming out uh, next year, published by Emmaus Academic Press. That that was going to be my next question. Emmaus Academic, that's awesome. They put out really really good stuff. Thanks. I was absolutely, uh, absolutely thrilled. Uh, uh, Matthew Levering from uh, has from Mundelein has just helped me a great deal uh, with this, and uh, uh, he introduced me to the person who introduced me to you. So I'm, right. I'm just, I'm just uh, really indebted to uh, to Dr. Levering. Yeah, our, our our mutual friend, classical theism. So yeah, the classical absolutely John DeRosa, wonderful yeah. guy. Yeah, absolutely. So once again, thank you so much for coming on. Truly enjoyed this. I look forward to talking to you again in the future. Uh, I do too. It's really been uh, really been a, a, a privilege. Thanks so much, Michael. Bye-bye. Glad to do it. Everybody hit that like button, subscribe button, share this on your Facebook, social media, all that good stuff. Also check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. By the way, shout out to Catholic Answers. Uh, Y'all know I'm an affiliate apologist with them, so shout out to them, especially because they are sponsoring this video through purchasing the camera lens that I'm currently using. So again, thank you to them. Go and hit that subscribe button to Catholic Answers if you haven't already. All right, y'all. We'll see you later. God bless.